Hi, welcome to Ignite Your Passion with me, Bonnie Lang, where I dive into the stories of individuals who have dared to pursue their dreams and ignite their passions. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Sheila Adams, the visionary behind Kai Simone Winery. Sheila's journey is a testament to the power of resilience, determination, and entrepreneurial spirit. Sheila followed her lifelong dream of starting her own business, ultimately founding Kai Simone Winery in Spring Branch, Texas. The winery embodies Sheila's dedication to family, tradition, and excellence. Join me as we explore the challenges, triumphs, and lessons Sheila has learned along the way. I'm super excited to announce that we have dove in. We have, we are chasing our dreams. We have downsized, we are selling our house. We have it up for sale and on the market. And we are living in an RV park. We've been here for three weeks and it is just, feels like full-time vacation. So I'm super excited and I can't wait to tell you more about it, but let's jump in. I can't wait to introduce you to Sheila. How are you this morning, Bonnie? It's nice to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Well, I'm happy we've got some sunshine. I bet you had an amazing weekend because the weather was nice. Actually, we had a great weekend. I mean, Saturday was super busy. I was kind of surprised because this is the the low season. So, But a lot of people came out because it was really nice and we had the patio open, but we had the screens down. So we got that nice ambient heat. So it was good. Oh, yay. Awesome. Well, I let's just go ahead and get started because I can't wait to hear all about your winery and the inspiration behind it. First off, tell us about yourself. Tell us where you're from and where you currently live. Okay. I am originally born and raised in Michigan. And specifically, I lived in Southwest Michigan. And I went to pretty much went to high school, all my schooling there. And I even did my bachelor's degree at Western Michigan University. So that's just like way back. (laughs) A little something, a little something about me. And, and then I, when I graduated, I was in their ROTC program. I went into the, so that was pretty much my majority of my adult career was in the United States army. Well, thank you so much for your service. Thank you. You're welcome. So you are living now, you're living here in Spring Branch? I actually live in Stone Oak. We initially planned to move to Spring Branch, but now the business pretty much has consumed the property, the winery. And so we kind of still keeping our eye on Spring Branch. But right now with everything going on in the world, the interest rates, yada, yada, we're just kind of taking it day by day, but we're looking, we're empty nesters. So we're looking to downsize and move into a one level, hopefully soon, maybe in the next three to five years. What you are doing now currently is running your own winery. That is correct. Yes. So I was fortunate that I got to retire early from the military. I did 28 years total when you think about like reserve time, active duty time, 24 years of active duty. And I had decided years ago when I got to the point where I knew I was going to retire from the military that I wanted to start my own business. And I didn't know it was going to be a winery, actually. I looked at different opportunities, but When I seen that this was a great opportunity and it really kind of allowed me to be flexible in the business plan, I turned my attention and and I start researching wineries in Texas. And here we are. The name of it is Kai Simone. Tell us where the name came from. Kai Simone Winery is actually the namesake of my two daughters. I'm married, two daughters. Um, I've been married for over 30 years, and so I have an older daughter, Jasmine Kai, and my youngest is Leah Simone, and I've always adored their names together, so their middle names, so it's Kai Simone. So then when I had the marketing people, we were looking at options for names and logos to reflect our brand. When I seen it, I was like, that's it. Kai Simone. And then when I actually seen the the logo that I decided to go with, I was sold. It's a beautiful name. You've been open since 2019. Is that right? That is correct. October, 2019. 
What were the steps that you took before you even started building? Oh, wow. I did a lot of research. So a lot of people, I research in terms of just doing field trips and going visit wineries, research and reading all about wineries, looking at like business plans, financials, different aspect of the winery business. I did a lot of reading. I went to a, a couple conferences, but I would say the the most impactful for me was actually getting in the field and going visit the wineries and talking to the owners, the manager, general managers, and the winemakers. And so the more information that I received, the more I wanted to learn about the business. So I had a friend who's a, like a wine connoisseur, and she would periodically, I would have diff, a couple different friends go out with me, and I would just honestly just go visit the winery, and I would just, you know, at wineries, you know, it's- Have a good well, time. <laughs> yeah, you go and you just have a good time. I mean, most people go to wineries, they want to drink, they just want to be in the hill country setting and enjoy themselves. And that was pretty much what I did. And I also did that like in Virginia and in Michigan and all, cause I'm from Michigan. So when I went home, even going from O'Hare to where I live, I would go past several different wineries. So I would tell my husband, or if I was by myself, I would just stop, pop in and Hey, can I look around? Sometimes the owner would be there. Sometimes it would be a general manager. I would tell them I was interested. And for the most part, most people were very transparent and open. What did your husband think? Because he's also retired military. Yeah, he is. He retired maybe about six or seven years before I did. And so I he knew that I had a thirst to open my own business since we've been together. And him and I have been very financially responsible and I'm a kind of a big saver, to be honest with you. And so in the military, a lot of our needs was taken care of. We got housing allowances. So I felt the need to be responsible and save, invest in my kids for college and do what I need to do to maximize my investments. And with the intent of you know, when I retire, I really want to open a business because I was like, I'm young. Hopefully I'll retire young. I'll be, I'll be got by God's grace. I'll be healthy. And, you know, that's kind of the way I, I looked at it. And my husband was like, go for it. Uh -huh. <laughs> he didn't know what, but he was like, let me know what you want to do. And I was like, okay. And so we talked about it at different points in time. And then when I actually really decided, it was probably, I think it was my last year in the military, probably about six to seven months out. And then I start kind of really focusing in on it. So then what was the actual process of building it? What was the first step? I guess you purchased the land and... You know, the well, the the... Focus was on the winery and then initially us building on the same property. And then I did have it in the back of my mind, oh, what if I decide I don't want to do this? So when we bought the land, the process was, oh, we're going to build a, build the business, but we can still build over here and build our retirement home if we wanted to. So yes, that was the first thing I did after I started doing a lot of research is I bought the property that had the opportunity for me to do commercial, right? Because I didn't want to get property that wasn't commercial because that would have been a whole nother, you know, hurdle to jump. So when we bought the property, a, about a quarter of it was commercially zoned already within the HOA. So believe it or not, I'm in the HOA. I don't know if you ever heard about Rivermont. Okay, yes, I have. Okay, so I'm actually in Rivermont. So initially I was kind of turned off by that because the way we think of HOAs these days, we think of them having a lot of command and control over what we can do in our space for yeah. our home. And so I was initially kind of turned off by that. And I talked to my husband and some friends about it. But then when I actually went and learned about the HOA and I actually talked to the property manager and I actually talked to this gentleman across the street whose family used to own all that land anyway, I was just kind of motivated to move forward. So yes, 
first thing we did was we purchased the land. Now you tell me if you want how detailed you want me to get, but when I decided to purchase the land, I did I was a little reserved because you know when you're purchasing land, you want to make sure you can do what you want to do with that land, right? right? Mm -hmm. So what I did was I told my real estate agent, I don't want to have to jump through hurdles. So I want to make sure we're doing this in a way that it's going to be less taxing and, you know, we can move forward when the time comes. Mm -hmm. So I want the gentleman that owns the land to submit a memorandum requesting, asking them to approve for me to open a winery in this location. Because when you're in the HOA, you have to get approvals. So even though I was a commercial business, and they, you know, they're, they've been there since I think the late 60s, early 70s. So their HOA requirements or bylaws are not even close to where I live, like in Stone Oak. You know what I mean? Because that was early on, but they still had to approve what you were putting there. You know what I mean? So the gentlemen that owned it, they were really interested in, in selling it. And so I wrote the letter for them, gave it to my real estate agent and then they submitted it to the HOA and I had already met, met the HOA property manager. So she had told me I couldn't do it because I didn't own the property at that time. But she was, I told her, I was just transparent. Hey, I'm retiring from the military. I'm yes. invested, interested in opening a winery on this location, possibly building a residential home on the far side of the property. But initially, we're going to start off with the winery. And she said, yes, you have to get approval, but you can't request it. The owner has to request it. So you see where the dynamics is? If I would have bought that property and then asked for approval and they said no, right? Then you, yeah. Then yeah, it would have been a wash. I would still have commercial property, but it would have been a wash. You know what I mean? Yeah. So unfortunately the gentleman i gave him the letter he submitted it i think the same day or the next day and with a week in a week or so they came back and they said yes you can open a winery on the residential part of the property and i was like i need that in writing so of course they they the, and since i had met the property manager she kind of gave me a heads up and they thought was kind of excited about it because everybody knows wineries is not like a bar you know what right. i mean Yes. It's it's a really nice kind of classy, low key place where people can come and get nice wine and hang out and have that winery experience. So that was kind of the process in getting the land. And so once we jumped that hurdle, I went to an architect and I pretty much explained to him and said, Hey, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. I visited all these wineries. Here's my vision board. So from visiting a lot of the wineries, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And this is why, because I learned a lot of things from talking to people in the cellar, pe managers in the tasting room. And then I had a wine consultant. So as soon as I got approved with the HOA, maybe not as soon as, maybe about within six months, I hired a wine consultant. And he was winemaker at a year in Virginia. He is well known. He's, you know, his, he, he's actually is a winemaker for a multi-million dollar winery. So he was on board with me for like two years until 2020, I think it was spring 20. So he was like my private tutor. And so, you know, people, I tell people, I feel like I don't feel like I just kind of went through this process with no missteps because I had that consultant and it, there was a lot of times and I can give you several examples where he would tell me, Sheila, back up. This is what we you need to think about if you want to do something like that, because that can be very costly or that's not necessary and it can cost you lots of money in the long run. So that was a very pivotal time that very pivotal time in the process that I hired that wine consultant. So I think I got approval in March or April of, of like seven, maybe, yes, yeah, 17. And then we start drafting up the architect plans like in August of 17. Then I got my wine consultant in September, October of 17. And then things started to move. So at the time I was 
looking at planning to build, working with the architect, working with the civil engineer, and this civil engineer, and this is just on paper, right? And I'm also learning from my um, wine consultant and I'm researching and I'm reading and I'm visiting wineries. And I went to a conference and I joined Texas Wine and Grape Growers. So that was kind of the process. It was all about getting all that information once I started that I was going to move forward and continually educating myself. That's incredible. I'm sure there was a lot of stress involved in that too, but then <laughs> having the wine consultant, I mean, that had to be so instrumental and just really getting out and talking to so many people. And I'm sure they told you what they wouldn't recommend, like, don't do this. Absolutely. Cause you know, I, I, when I would approach people, I was always transparent and say, Hey, I'm retiring. I'm looking at getting into this field and I want to open a winery, not a wine bar. And this, of course, you're a winery. And I would say, what is something that you wish you would have did different? And what are you so proud about that you did that is, you know, working to your, in your interest right now? So I would ask the definitive questions as well. And then, of course, I would ask about how do you like being in this business and stuff like that. So I learned quite a bit that really helped me in my process of preparing to build as well as building. How would you respond to those questions now from your, your perspective? You know what? He was absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one example. Like for instance, I had this vision that I was going to have a, you know that I was going to have a small seller and I wanted it like everything else in the building to be kind of exquisite, nice. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to put down tile and he was like, that's not a good idea. But, and I'm going to tell you why, and it's your money and you mm -hmm. got to make the ultimate decision. So that's kind of the way he would approach it. Cause of course I'm paying him. So he's working on my behalf. So what he told me is that the tile, because there's a lot of processing in the cellar, and the type of, I mean, you know, through the fermentation process, through the different treatments we use in the wine, when the, if the wine spills on the floor, which is inevitable, it is going to get the grout grungy. It's going to affect the aesthetics and it's going to be hard to keep clean. And it's not ideal conditions for the people that are going to be working in the cellar because, you know, just a basic room finish. So in essence, he was saving me money, basically. He was like, you just need to put a concrete floor. It needs to be broom finished, something that you can go in there and you can power wash, spray, clean it off. But it doesn't need to be fancy because it's not idea for the conditions you need to make wine, store wine. And if something happened, it spills all over the place, clean it up. And it's really not safe. It's more hazardous. So he saved, like I said, he saved me money. So if someone were to ask me, I would share the same, I would share my same thoughts because I actually visited a couple wineries where I seen that. And it was exactly what he said. Oh. And I've also visited, visited a brewery. And as I look down in the grout over their tanks, it's like black and it's like corroded and it doesn't look aesthetically pleasing. Yes. And when I ask people, they're giving me the kind of behind the scenes, look, how do you get that clean? And they're like, oh, it's so difficult to get clean. It's oh. the worst. And I was asking the workers and they were like, cause you know, you're more prone to slip and fall. It's not good to keep clean and you can't really keep it clean. So even if we clean it, it's going to look that way and it's going to come across as dirty. So then I got the real world answer to what I was being told theoretically so a lot, of, I had a lot of those moments, to be honest with you. So that was just one. So yes, I would definitely share that kind of stuff with anybody that asks. And so you make your own wine. Not all wineries really truly make their own wine. So that's really cool. What do you, do you have a favorite? Do you do red wines? What type of wine? Um, I'm, I'm a, I like wine paired with food and I like to go to wine and food pairings. And I typically will lean mostly toward drier wines, to be honest with you. I, I think it just 
you have I for me this is just me speaking I believe it has you have is is better pairing options and I think it has better health benefits but I I just enjoy drier wines I you know one time I think when I was younger I didn't drink a lot but when I would indulge I would have to have something a little sweeter but nowadays I am very comfortable with the drier wines having it with my meal and having the total sensory experience with it, I really appreciate it. So I would say you drier wines, and then I would lean, lean toward like more of a cab or a Merlot. On the heavier side, I do like a good Petit Syrah. In the summertime, I will do a nice Riesling. I'll do a nice Chardonnay, a Rosé. But like I said, I, I tend to have it with food. I would tend to have wine with my food experience. So you do something different then based on the season? Yes, we do for event on the event side. So when I built the winery, um, I envisioned starting out that I wanted to do not just a winery, but I wanted to have an event center. So we actually have an event room, which we use as a lounge during the times we're open to the public, but you can rent it. You can have birthday parties. You can, we have dinner receptions. We have wedding receptions. We've had fundraisers. Uh, you can do a wedding there and hopefully we'll do our first one this year, but we've been doing a lot of renting. We just, we rent it to Spring Branch Bolverde. Uh, Bovardi and Spring Branch Chamber last week did like an executive strategy retreat last Tuesday, and it was all day from like 8 to 4.30. So we're only open on Saturday and Sunday, and everything else is private, whether you book a private event or you can book a private wine tasting and a tour. You can book a private class for your group. I have people that come in and teach classes. We do pain and sip gourmet cookie decorating. We do wine bottle decorating with fairy lights. We do two different type of classes. I do one of those classes and I do it with a stained glass. I teach you how to turn the bottle into a stained glass with fairy lights with a cork. It's really nice. And then we have a wine glass decorating class with soy wax. Someone else comes in and teach that as well. And then what's the other one I'm trying to think of? I think I've missed the one. I might have said a pain and sip yeah. wine bottle. Yeah. So and if you go to our website, you can see it. So and some people have private birthday parties and they'll say, oh, we want to do a pain and sip. OK, we can do a pain and sip. We'll bring in the instructor and they'll do a pain and sip and they usually will reserve it for about two hours and it's private. So anything, anytime we don't have anything going on private during the time we're open to the public. But anytime we're not open to the public, there's a window of opportunity for you to book anything private. For like the pain and sips. So that's only for someone that's organized it? Or do you offer it like me as an individual? Let's just say, I'd love to do that and meet new people. Yes. So right now I'm offering, and those are our winery hosted classes. So if you see it advertised, like go to my website right now, you're going to see, um, a gourmet cookie decorating class that's going to be February the 11th and Lana's Charming Treats out of New Braunfels. They're going to come in and they're going to teach that class and they're going to teach you how she makes the cookies and she's going to teach you different beginner techniques on how to decorate the cookies. So you can then take those cookies with you and you can give them to a gift for to your husband if you want or to your significant other or you can eat the or cookies. Or eat them yourself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got that one going on. And then we have another one. I think it's February 20 something. I'm doing a stain, stained glass, a bottle decorating class with fairy lights. And so you can see different examples of it. We usually advertise with the actual craft so you can see it. So yes, that's our wine and rehosted event. So if you see it on our website, I'm hosting it. Okay. And anybody can come. So you can come or you can bring a girlfriend or you can just say, we have people, it's like, I want to get out the house today and buy a ticket and they come by themselves. That's fine. Absolutely. I love it. I love your social media. And if anyone's interested in learning more, they can actually like look at it and see the stained glass. And so I was like, wow, that's really cool. And then everything you do and the cooking. 
tell us about the cooking. The okay, so I do, I will do cooking at home and then I would like pair stuff. That's just me, just like, this is real me. I'm cooking like, for instance, I make gumbo and I show you how to make, I make gumbo house, taught to make it. I was in the military, so I've been exposed to a lot of different cultures and I've taken advantage of that and learned different things. I had a good girlfriend, a good friend from uh, New Orleans who taught me how to make gumbo. And I've learned how to make the stained glass, how to do stained glass and with the liquid letting and just regular letting when I was in Korea. So I took classes, craft classes, cooking classes, and I've, I just always enjoyed it. So when I'm at home, I'm just like really preparing dinner for me and my husband and our empty nesters. And I'm just like, oh, I'm going to set up my camera and just capture the moment. And then I'll post it and say, oh, you can pair this with our Sauvignon Blanc or you can pair this with our Merlot or our Pinot Noir. And then at the winery, we have, I'll bring a chef in, different chefs, and we'll do cooking classes. So it's free for the wine club. So we pay for everything in advance. He'll cook it and bring it to the winery and they'll be plating it in the kitchen. And during the cooking class, he will do a demonstration and show you how to cook. I think we've done it twice last year already, but this year we're going to do it a little bit more. So I think the one in August was really nice. It was crowded. He did a, a linguine with a, a Asiaga sauce and he did it with shrimp. And then he did a chicken dish with some mashed potato cauliflowers. And so if you're in the audience, you get to taste everything and you get to pair it with the wine. And while he's making it, he's telling you, these are the ingredients I picked, I put in it. You can see me putting the ingredients in it. Him and I are having a conversation and he's saying, oh, this is why I picked the, the Riesling or this is why I picked the, the Viognier. And then the audience gets to, to taste it. So with that class, if it fills up, advertise it. So we do it with the um, wine club. But sometimes I'll try to hold back 10 or 15 tickets and then you can pay $45 or $50. I forget what it is. And then you can join us if you want to come. Oh, that it sounds like you're having so much fun. It is. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. And that's kind of the 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 path I wanted to take is to do more food and wine. And then like a lot of wineries, some wineries have a restaurant. We don't have a restaurant as of yet. I'm looking at the idea of doing a bistro and we may even be doing that. I'm We're still working on that, but we have a menu of food. So we got a, chi, a charcuterie tray with Italian meats and we make them every weekend. We have a cheese tray with no meats. We have a brie tray with just berries and some, some spreads. And mostly all of them have spreads too. We have chicken on a stick. We have meatballs and marinara sauce. We have an artichoke and spinach and Parmesan dip with veggies like broccoli, spears, carrots, cucumber chips, a little chocolate, you know. So when you come, you can, and if you don't want to eat, we got crackers or pretzels or, you know. <laughs> yeah. Do you plan like the the charcuterie boards? Are you the one? I do. I did. I, I plan everything that we have. I did plan it. So, and let me back up though. <laughs> I learned from someone. So I was helping someone and I kind of learned the craft of how to set up charcuterie and make sure you got the the sweet, the spicy, the the bland, the creamy, you know. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. You're amazing. Thank so you. Of course. Look, it's just Asian wisdom is what I call it. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you get older, you pay attention and then you just kind of pull everything together, take advantage of what you learn from elders or other people that have groomed you coming up and, and use it to your advantage, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It sounds like you have a lot, though, to keep up with. Do you have someone that helps you with your social media and your husband? What role does he play in this? <laughs> well, you're not, you're not going to believe me when I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Listen, Bonnie, you know what? Have you seen those social media posts where you see the business, small business owners, and they'll say, I'm the salesperson. And then they'll show them in another setting. I'll meet our general manager. And they'll say, <laughs> meet our shipping person. It's the same person. That's kind of what I feel. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I feel like. But, but no, in all reality, my husband is gold. I mean, he is the GOAT. He... Believe it or not, behind the scenes, everything is beautiful, like outside. And people always talk about how it looks. He is like, I call him our, I call him my seller manager. And I call him our landscape engineer, our grounds engineer. <laughs> I've given him all these fancy titles, but he doesn't necessarily want to be in the, at the forefront, but he does a lot behind the scenes in helping me like rack wine, move wine, take care of the sellers. I mean, when it comes to the, to the muscle and the grunt work and moving stuff and he is doing that, you know what I mean? Like, yes, I do. A, I do do some things in the cellar and stuff like that. Definitely. But he helps out a lot, like keeping the place looking nice outside, helping me in the cellar. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I could do in the cellar anyway, but I mean, I don't, particularly I, I've never racked wine without him. You know what I mean? Like if you got to move wine from one tank to another, hook up the hose and all that other stuff, he's always there. You know what I'm saying? And he's always doing the bulk of it. And I appreciate that. But when it comes to like, you asked me social media, so I didn't forget your question. So I did have someone when I started out that was doing my social media. I helped design my website, but I actually had a company do it. And I had a young lady that was helping me do the website, my social media, and then she had some things going on and couldn't continue at the time. And so, you know, everything was just snowballing and I took it all over and I'm like, okay, I'll look for someone later, but in the meantime, I'll manage it. So I pretty much manage the website, do all my social media, all of it. We're open on Saturday and Sunday. And my vision was we're only going to be open Saturday and Sunday for people to come in and do wine tasting to the public. Yeah. And we'll do private events through the week. But honestly, Bonnie, it didn't work that way. Most people want to do events on the weekends, right? Yeah. And so I tr I'm, this year, I'm going to try to work hard to see if I can pull in some businesses to rent space. But like last week, Spring Branch Bolverde or Bolverde Spring Branch rented space to do their meeting. And I could probably get more people like that. But historically through the week, I don't have a lot going on other than me doing administrative stuff at home. At home. So the reason why I point that out is because I will try to focus on the social media one or two days out of the week and prepping things I need to push out or post on the website and stuff like that. So if I start getting busy through the week, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. <laughs> but right, right now I pretty much, I've self-taught. I've done a lot of YouTube videos. My daughter just graduated from University of Houston in business. So she just moved to Chicago a couple of weeks ago and working for Pepsi. I'll call her and I'll say, Hey, I'm trying to do this. This was like two years ago. She would have to help me a lot. But now she'll come to me, mom, how did you do that? How did you do this? And how I do it is I'll find certain social media influencers who are really good about posting and being unique about what they're posting and everything is just not the same. They got good transitions and I'll kind of go to the page and when they're teaching you, I'll watch or I'll go to the YouTube and I'll learn how to do it. I'll Google it and say, how do I do this in CapCut? How do I do this in the photo, in the photo room? And that's kind of how I've been learning. You do an awesome job. Well, I need to like learn from you. <laughs> I love it. It's awesome. So what would you say one of your biggest challenges has been? And maybe it was what you just mentioned. Mm, my biggest challenge has been and continues to be is I got to continuously stop, pause, and learn things. Yeah. I'll give you an example. So 
we decided we wanted to just do a, a couple grape groves. And obviously in the Texas Hill Country, there's a lot of challenges with water and we didn't want to pull from our well. So then I had to learn all about the rain catchment system. And then I had to talk to my husband about, well, hey, can you get with Rusty and you guys come up with a plan on how to run the irrigation over to the area where I want to have the grapes? Can we tee it off? And if we tee it off, will you be able to do individual vats so that we don't have to run out there all the time? Can we put it on a timer? So, I mean, a lot of that is me doing a lot of research and my husband's like, oh, sure, I can put a timer on there when you get to that point. He's very familiar with that stuff. But when it came to doing the rain catchment, I had to learn about it. How is this going to be beneficial? How are we going to capture the water? And so when we built our pavilion, we built that in mind. Okay, we're going to put a rain catchment system behind there, and then we're going to create a a T to run it to the, the irrigation to the grape growth so that we can start growing grapes. So that's my biggest challenge because there's lots of times that I have to do that. Initially, I didn't plan on making wine and it just, it just happened. So now, yes, I have a wine consultant still, not the one that I had before, but we parted with great relations. So I would definitely recommend him to anybody. He was great, but I wanted someone in Texas that I could reach out and touch. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a gentleman that is my wine consultant and he's available for me to consult with him primarily about the winemaking process and he comes into the cellar. We pretty much do all of our chemistry panels and send them off to the lab, to make sure the wine can stand up in the bottle. And he'll say, oh, I think this wine is good. And I'll say, mm, I think it's got too many tannins. I want it smoother. And that's his job to tell me, okay, how we can get it smoother is we're going to have to do this. We can add these type of berry tannins to it or whatever, or no, we just need to leave it in the barrel. It depends. He's this expert. So I have to rely on him to, to tell me where I'm deficient because it's just lack of knowledge because I'm still learning. Yeah. And so I feel pretty comfortable in making white wines, but it's the red wines and the blending. But even with the white wines, I kind of run into something here and there and I'm like, oh, I want to make sure I did this right. I want to make sure that it's going to stand up in the bottle. Nicholas, can we go over this? Can we talk about this? So it's a constant because it's a whole new feel for me. And so there's not just a recipe. It's not like you're baking cookies and this is the amount of flour you need. And Correct. If I put you and me, we went to two different corners and they gave us 10 different spices, some hamburger meat, some sausage, some spaghetti noodles or whatever and told us to go in our respective corners and make spaghetti it's going to taste different right of course <laughs> yours is going to be a lot better <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know <laughs> um, but the, my point there is Bonnie is that the winemaking process is specific to the winery or the winemaker and I may choose to use a different type of yeast than another winery. I may choose to use a different type of nutrient or preservative. So you're going to have different decision points in that process that is ultimately going to change whether my wine is going to differ from somebody else's wine. And the chances being it is because... We're not going to make the same decisions at various different decision points, What, no matter which winery it is. You know what I mean? Like my wine, my wine consultant has a preference in where we might purchase tannins or the type of preservatives or the type of yeast that we might use. And some people we may make their own yeast. I, we, I'm not there yet, but I mean, some people have unique wine because they might make their own yeast or they might make their own nutrient. And there's no way you're going to replicate that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm, yeah. So I might go to Scott's lab and buy this and decide, nope, I'm not going to buy my nutrients at Scott's lab. I'm going to buy it 
from over here. So those are the challenges in the winemaking process, or I would say decision points. And it's like anything else, you know, based off of what your, what your goal is in that wine making process is going to influence what you're going to do during those various different stages. Do you offer tours of the cellar of your winery? We absolutely do. So we do tours during private tastings. And if you, let's say you book a class, let's see this. If you do like, let's say you did a stained glass bottle decorating class with the fairy lights and you called me up and said, Hey, she lives this Bonnie. And I got 10 girlfriends. We want to come do your class. And I was like, Oh, okay, that's great. It's going to be this much per person plus tax and 18% gratuity. It's the exact same price that I would charge you whether you came, if I hosted it or if you hosted the class yourself. The only difference is you you have to have a minimum of, uh, I think for each class, like some instructors want 10, but for my class, I'd say eight. You gotta at least have eight people. And so if you do that, it's gonna be private. You're gonna be there with me. It's gonna include a a glass of wine while we're making whatever we're making. And then it's going to include a tour. That's fabulous. Oh, I'm so excited for you. I love this. Thank you. <laughs> what have you found rewarding about your journey? And by the way, I like your nails. I saw the little wine glass on your nail. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why. Okay, let's, see you can, let's see, I'll show one. Yes. It's time for me to get them done. And that's the other one. Love it. <laughs> so there's a story. There's always a story. <laughs> for the holidays, for December, I think it was like the second week in December, she did my nails. And then I had to go to a gala at the Wit Museum, like January 12th. And I told her, hey, just do the same thing. It was really cool. But this time, make it a red wine glass. She just had like two bubblies. And I said, just do the same thing because I knew I would be in and out of there. And so I had it for like two months, but I got it done in between. So she wanted to do the wine glass starting out. And I thought it was pretty cool and I liked it. So I rode with it the second time around. So yeah, I love it. <laughs> Representing. <laughs> yeah. So you said the challenge, you told me, you asked me what's been the been like a rewarding. Most rewarding. Uh, the most rewarding for me is that I've accomplished something, a, very, a tremendous feat. I've changed careers and I've gone full swing, a full, I mean, forward in this business. And it's just rewarding that I'm learning a lot and I was crawling. Now I'm starting to take steps and I can see the progress. And so I still have a lot to learn. So I still call myself a neophyte. I still call myself a student of the wine, a student, a novice of the wine business. And I'm okay with that. But I'm just happy with where I've kind of landed so far. And I haven't landed to pause. I might, well, land it to stay there. I just pause a little bit and then we continue to move forward. I just look at it as a great opportunity. So I've... Um, I've been enjoying it. It's been challenging. I've run into obstacles where it's been very stressful, but then I appreciate when we rise above and overcome it, and then we can move forward. Beautiful, beautiful. Where do you get your motivation and inspiration? I think just by nature, um, and I actually, I'm going to do a post. I was going to, I was actually working on a post today. If you look at a glass, and it was glass half empty, half, so when you see it today, you can be like, oh, we talked about that. <laughs> if I put a glass down, when I was in the military, I was a behavioral health officer, specifically a clinical work, clinical social worker. And then I got my PhD and started doing a lot of research and writing. And then I was over a lot of clinical services in the military. But by nature, I'm a very kind of positive person. And believe that there's a, there's power in our thoughts and in our beliefs, and that really does translate into behavior. And so I've always just kind of moved throughout life like that. Like, okay, I'm thinking negative about this. I I need to change my I need to change my way of thinking. How can I look at this, and what can I get positive out of this, or how can I turn this around? 
and I noticed that it does it it minimizes my stress or my anxiety or depression if I look at it different. I mean, certainly I've had challenges. I've always had challenges like any other person in the world, but I I can honestly say that I've never let it cripple me. That you know, you might have I have to pause and maybe deal with stress or anxiety or depression or whatever, but I always find a way to turn that into a different type of energy and manifest something that eases me or make me more comfortable or pushes me toward my goal or I'm renewed in spirit. What advice would you give someone that's aspiring to start their own winery or another passion? And they be either, maybe they've started and stopped or maybe they just haven't even started. You know what? The first thing I'm going to say is go for it, but do it responsibly because with a plan, you're going to feel more confident. I'm not saying you can't move forward without the plan, but most people don't. So I think if you have a plan and something that you can go by and you set targets, I'm one of those people when I set goals for myself, I feel pressured to move forward. And, and so the plan works for me. So of course I had a business, I did a business plan. I spelled out what I wanted my winery to be. And I think if I pulled out my very first business plan and you read it, you would be like, that's exactly what she's doing. And what it's evolved to now is just being a little bit more finesse because I'm actually doing it now. And so if someone's out there and they want to do it, I would strongly encourage them to don't come down on yourself. One, you have to believe in yourself that you can do it. And then if you're that person that needs to plan, plan and set up target dates, have a friend or someone that you trust and that is going to hold you accountable and encourage you and be positive to hold you accountable. It's one thing to hold somebody accountable and put them down, but it's another thing to hold them accountable and say, Come on, friend. I know you really want this. You could do it. What can I do to help you out? Your first step is to start visiting wineries. That's what you put on your plan. I'll go with you to a couple of wineries on Saturday. Which wineries do you want to go to? Do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's different. And so I would say, you know, definitely go for it. And given a little background in the industry, Texas, I think, is number six of the largest six or seven um, pr production in terms of winery production. But we only produce about seven to eight percent. Eighty four. Eighty four percent of the wine in America is produced by California. They have counties dedicated to being wine regions. Correct. Do you know? We have five regions in Texas. We're only like, we're number seven and we have a lot of growth in this, in the state that can happen. So there's a lot of room for people to get in this business, whether it's the winery business, the brewery business, distillery business, or if there's some other business that you want to open, there's always an opportunity in there. No one's going to do it like you. So even if someone is making greeting cards, they're not going to make greeting cards like you, girl. Absolutely. <laughs> and we know to call you when we need that positivity. We I need that motivation. So you're going to say, and I'm going to tell you, Bonnie, this is the truth. And you can talk, you can, you can even talk to my friends. No one knew that I was going to open a winery until I was probably about, 30% into building the building. Really? I, didn't, I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell my friends. My husband knew. And then I had a friend that was going with me visiting wineries and we were just kind of talking about it. But, and it had nothing to do with them being negative. I was just concerned that someone might say something like, oh, you know, it's going to be tough to get in the wine business. And and that would then paralyze me. Do you know what I mean? 
Yes, absolutely. I'm going to have that negativity in my thought process from someone that I love and respect. And they didn't even intend it that way. So I just did it because I said, this has, this is me and my husband's money. This is our experience. And I don't, I just don't want anything to be perceived and stopping me from moving forward and accomplishing my goal, whether it's intended or not. And I, it was just better for me. So that was kind of how I moved forward. And then when I did it, I would hear things from my friends that really wasn't negative. But at that stage, I was like, you know, 30% building, had all my tanks ordered and different things like that. So it didn't affect me in the same way. That was just my, that was my style for me at the time, because I knew that it would be a business that would be a little challenging to get into, but it was not impossible. No, I can see that. Thank you for telling us why. Tell us where you're located again. Tell us the name, where we can find you and about your social media. And I'll also include a a link in the actual show notes that'll have this information. But just tell us for anyone that's driving while they're listening to this. Okay. Okay. All right. Don't stop. She's going to post. So be be safe. (laughs) Uh, I am in Spring Branch. Our winery is Kai Simone Winery. I am actually on Spring Branch Road. So you can hit me off of 46 and 281. And I love the location because I'm right next to the Guadalupe River. So they got Guadalupe right next to Nichols Landing, right? So they got public access and directly across the street from me is the Guadalupe RV park. So my understanding is he's been there since the 60s, the mid to late 60s. So a lot of people know where that's at. So if you come in off of 281, we actually have signs on the side of the road that says Kaisamon Winery, turn, got point the arrow left or on the other side, if you're going south, is pointing the arrow going right. And so if you come off of 281, it's about three miles and you'll go over the Guadalupe Bridge. And as soon as you cross over, that's my building on the right. If you come from 46, it's going to be almost like exactly six and a half miles from 46. And we'll be on your left. And your website? My website is www.kai, K-A-I. Simone, S-I-M-O-N-E, winery.com. And it's in Google. So it's such a unique name that if you put Kai Simone and start doing winery, it's going to pop up. If you're in, if you're from Texas, it's going to pop up because it's just a regional thing. Beautiful. And we actually have, we sell about 14, 15 different wines right now. We have a wine club. We do classes, we rent private space, and we're open on Saturdays and Sundays from one to five. You can walk in, you can enjoy wine tasting, you can do glasses of wine, you can do bottles of wine. We have food and light bites to pair with your wines. In the spring and in the fall during the wine tour season, we have live music every Saturday from like two to five. And all genres, we got smooth R&B, neo-soul, country, folk, indie alternative. We have all of it. So, and we're getting ready to do some renovations to the main building to make our event room bigger, as well as uh, semi-enclosing the seating area on the patio side. So it would be cooler in the summer. Last year, we didn't get a chance to use it. It was so hot. And then, of course, warmer in the wintertime. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us today that I can? Oh, in my social media handle, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter. I don't do as much as Twitter or TikTok. I do post on TikTok, though, probably not as much. But all of my handles is really easy. It's at Kaisama Winery. So you can kind of see what we're about on on our stories. We're always posting what's going on and sign up for classes that we host. And and then if you go to our webpage, you can always see what's going on at the winery. Right when you land on the page, you're going to see three boxes. I think one says book a private wine tasting class. One says see upcoming events. And one says like 
pay for tickets to attend upcoming events or something like that. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being a guest today. It was such a pleasure having you and getting to meet you. I hope I answered all your questions. Absolutely. It was so much fun. I absolutely loved it. Um, well, thank you, Bonnie, so much for reaching out and taking the time to interview me. I really appreciate it because this is definitely marketing for me. And I do want to reach out to the community and invite everyone to come out. We have wine that in, that you can enjoy. I'm sure we can find two or three wines that you would like. And so hopefully the community will come out when they have some time and support us. Absolutely. This was so incredible. Today's episode with Sheila reminds me of the power of taking risks and following dreams, whether it's starting a winery or downsizing to live in an RV like me and my better half have done. Embracing change and stepping outside of our comfort zones can lead to incredible adventures and personal growth. I hope Sheila's story has inspired you to pursue your passions, no matter where they may lead. Stay tuned as this podcast transitions into RV life, music on the road, and places we explore. Until the next episode, keep daring to dream big. Sending you peace, love, happiness, and hugs. Be sure to share this with a friend and learn how we earn thousands of dollars selling everything in our home and we're able to pay off debt. We will have a workshop coming very soon. So stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe.